Hello, everyone. <laughs> I am Marty Hurst, professor and head of school for the School of Information, and judging from these robes, the Grand Wizard for the commencement ceremony. <laughs> I would like to welcome the family and friends who have traveled from all over the country and the world to support the graduates. I also want to say, thank the iSchool faculty and the staff, who you can't see behind the scenes, who are here to support our students and who have done such a wonderful job preparing this, uh, the logistics for this important event. To our graduates, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this year's commencement ceremony. Congratulations on reaching this significant milestone in your academic journey. Yeah. <laughs> Graduation is kind of like the season finale of your favorite TV show, except instead of binge watching, you've been binge studying for years. <laughs> and now, just like that season finale, you're left wondering, what happens now? Today we have the iSchool's largest commencement to date, with a total of 350 out of 608 graduates here with us in this building today. Yeah, big number. We are celebrating the achievements of our students in three master's programs, the Master's of Information Management and Systems, the Master of Information and Data Science, and the Master of Information and Cybersecurity. Yeah! <laughs> we are also celebrating our students completing the PhD in Information Science. Yeah! As graduates of the School of Information, you have acquired the knowledge and skills necessary to navigate the rapidly evolving landscape of information technology, data science, and cybersecurity. You've also gained a deep understanding of the ethical, social, and cultural implications of these technologies, and you're well equipped to use your knowledge and skills to make a positive impact on the world. In the coming years, you will tackle the pressing issues of the day, from designing the future of human AI interfaces to assuring technology is equitable and accessible to all, to reducing misinformation, to applying technology to tackle climate change. Climate change is especially timely. After we finish handing out the diplomas today, it will be one degree higher in here. <laughs> As you embark on the next phase of your careers, whether in academia, industry, or the public sector, I urge you to remember our iSchool values to advance knowledge and practice wherever people interact with information and technology. Approach your work with intellectual curiosity. Be mindful of the impact of your work on society and strive to use your expertise to make a positive difference in the world. I'm confident you will achieve great things and I look forward to following your successes in the years to come. Please attend alumni events and stay in touch with your fellow graduates and the greater iSchool community. Congratulations once again, and best wishes for a bright and fulfilling future. Now I'm honored to introduce you to our keynote speaker, MIMS 2008 alum, Kenichi Ueda. Yeah. Kenichi is co-founder and co-director of iNaturalist, an online social network and data recording platform for biodiversity-focused naturalists. He's been working on and using iNaturalist since 2008, when it be began first as his team project in Info 213, User Interface Design and Development, and then as his MIMS final project here at the School of Information. iNaturalist grew out of Oueda's belief that he might not be alone in his desire to combine nature and the web. Fifteen years later, it is still growing, with a community of nearly six million registered users and more than 125 million nature observations of over 400,000 different species on all seven continents. Recently, the New York Times called the app, quote, the nicest place online, unquote. Yeah. Kenichi embodies the values of the iSchool, creating new technology for social good, applying user-centered design, and using insights from social sciences. 
Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Kenichi. Uh, thank you, Marty. And just want to give another huge congratulations to the class of 2023. So cool, you guys all made it. Uh, some of you just earned another row on your LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> awesome. Uh, some of the folks behind me just earned the eternal right to insist that everyone in their lives refer to them as doctor. <laughs> um, but that's why you all are here, uh, and I totally, I get that. I don't really know why I'm here. <laughs> uh, it's true that I was sitting where all of you were sitting about 15 years ago. I graduated from the MIMS program. And it's also true that I still pedal in and ponder information professionally and for fun. Um, so it's possible that I'm here to tell you about one potential direction that you all can take from this point forward. Or maybe as one of the few people on Earth who has spent literally over a decade working on an iSchool final project, <laughs> I'm here as some kind of cautionary tale. Uh, you know, don't, don't be this guy. Uh, he didn't really understand what graduation meant. He didn't, he didn't realize that you could stop and, and do anything else. Um, I'm a little alarmed to entertain the thought that I'm here to give you all advice of some kind. If, if you are anything like the people that I went to the School of Information with, um, you're all smarter than I am. Uh, and you've spent the last few years hanging around professors and researchers and your fellow students, all of whom are really among some of the brightest lights in the world. I've spent the last 15 years desperately searching through Stack Overflow, trying to find like the right answer. Um, so I've made a few poor choices, and maybe you all should giving, be giving me advice. So I'm not, I'm not going to give you much advice here, nor am I really going to try and inspire you or convince you that working with information is still worth it, despite you know, the looming demise of democracy and the entrenchment of capital and the myriad misuses of literally every good idea technologists have ever come up with. Um, I'm just going to tell you about a few events from my life with information, mostly with, related to iNaturalist. Uh, that's, really, that's really all I feel I have to give you. I hope they strike a chord with what you've learned over the last few years and some of the great work that you're all about to do in the world. And if you find yourself inspired, I assure you it will be by accident. <laughs> all right, so if there isn't a particularly descriptive blurb in your program or if Marty's introduction was, didn't quite uh, paint a picture for you, um, actually, I, John was just telling me that all of you were forced to use iNaturalist in one of your classes. so. <laughs> Uh, you all know what it's about, but your parents don't. So um, just a little thumbnail, iNaturalist is a website, an app, where you uh, upload your pictures of organisms you see in nature. So if you see, you go on a hike and you see a cool newt on the trail, you can upload that to the internet. And other people on the internet can see what you posted and they can tell you what kind of newt it was and they can, you can talk to them about, you know, what's the life of a newt like? Um, so the next time you're on a trail, you can impress your friends and family by saying, you know, that's not just a newt, that's a California newt. <laughs> and if you eat it, it will kill you. Um, <laughs> bonus, every time you do that, you're recording useful information, right? So you're taking a picture, you're recording this what, where, and when uh, about biodiversity, and that's enormously beneficial to scientists and conservationists who really need that information to do their work. Um, it's actually... That kind of information is pretty, pretty rare. Or information about where organisms are is pretty rare, like unless that organism is Rihanna or Elon or something. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the thumbnail. I, that was my final project. I'm still working on it. Um, and all of my stories kind of revolve around it. So uh, those of you who were forced to use it, if you had a bad time, sorry. Um, so my first story begins in 2010. It was two years after I'd graduated. And I was mostly keeping INET going on my own. And this guy gave a talk here at Cal over across campus at Mulford Hall. And his name was Scott Laurie. And he's an, he was an ecologist. And he just had uh, just published a paper in Nature, kind of a big deal. Um, and it was about how quickly climate change will shift environmental envelopes. You know, like, where is the like, average 70 degree band on the Earth gonna, gonna move to given climate change? And whether or not the organisms that need those climatic conditions, maybe you need it hot, maybe you need it cold, um, whether they can move quickly enough to keep up with those shifting envelopes. Um, so to study this problem, Scott 
needed information, like all good scientists. And for the climate stuff, he had satellites, right? Satellites are these information gathering and producing marvels, and it was so much data about climate, about you know, how hot and how much rain and how much ice. Uh, so he did a really good job of, of, of thinking about where those um, envelopes were gonna be. But the other side of it, where the organisms were, that was kind of missing. Um, satellites can tell you about trees, and they can tell you about elephants, and these days they could tell you about really slow-moving squirrels. Um, but they can't really tell you about that newt under a log or that bee on a flower. For that, you really still need people on the ground looking at these things and recording, these da recording the data manually. And if you want to get that kind of data, you need to go, again, across campus over to MVZ and look in their drawers and drawers of jars of dead things. That's how we database this kind of information. And that's just limited by how many drawers you can stuff dead things into. Um, which is a long way of saying that basically there's not a lot of that kind of data, and every time Scott would give a talk about his research, he would end by saying, you know what we need? We need this giant group of people with their smartphones taking pictures of organisms so that we can have this giant database that's gonna rival all the satellites. And someone that I knew was in the crowd and was like, are you, are you talking about iNaturalist? Is, is that what you're talking about? So Scott and I got in touch, and um, my first impression of him was, Wow, this guy talks way too much. <laughs> uh, Scott had a lot of big ideas and big plans about what he wanted to do with INAT, and he really wanted to tell me about them, like, a lot, and I really didn't care, because that's just not how I think. It's not how I learn, that kind of, like, verbal barrage. Um, I like to read, I like to consider, sometimes I like to write my thoughts down but that kind of verbal excess is not my preferred uh, way to consume information. It's not really what I like, and despite present circumstances aside, it's not generally how I like to communicate information. Um, so apologies to those of you who are like me. Uh, so I was kind of like, whatever, this guy's full of it, not unlike several other people with big ideas and big plans for INAT who had approached me in the two years since leaving the iSchool. But I'd found that I had a really good mechanism for testing folks out, which was, did they actually upload any observations to INET? Because <laughs> if they didn't, that means they didn't, you know, jump that lowest hurdle. They didn't even sign up for an account. They didn't even try to use this thing that they were trying to exploit. Um, so, you know, I had, this, I had this talk with Scott, and I was like, eh, whatever, he's not, he's not really into this. But I'll just check out and see, like, whether he signed up. And he definitely signed up. He'd signed up and he'd added 60 plus observations. And they weren't just observations of his spouse and his dog, which is what pretty much everyone uploads uh, for the first time. Uh, he'd, he'd posted an unusual local toad, uh, a Colobus monkey from fieldwork he'd done in Tanzania, and a bunch of plants from a hike he'd gone on in Glen Canyon in San Francisco. And I could tell from these informational imprints that you know, even though my first impression was kind of right, like Scott does like to talk a lot, my emotional read was totally wrong. Um, I'd kind of written him off, but in the information I could see that Scott was like me. He wasn't just talking about weird bugs and plants, like he, he really cared about them. He cared enough to slow down 60 plus times on his hike in Glen Canyon and take a picture of them. So it was this encoding and sharing of his behavior that let me see something that I failed to see in person. I failed to see it in conversation, that Scott and I share a fundamental kinship over our love of other organisms. INAT served as kind of a prosthesis for my underdeveloped social skills. It was that trust that led me to start working with Scott, and it's what, what's kept us working together for 13 years now. And I'll be honest, he still kind of annoys the hell out of me a lot of the time. <laughs> Um, but, you know, when he's like two minutes into a monologue, I know that, like me, he'd, he'd probably prefer to be looking at a newt. <laughs> All right, second story. Um, one day in the middle of the pandemic, remember that? We received an email at INAT from a South African botanist informing us that police in the Cape region had detained a poacher with a bag full of succulent plants and a phone full of videos he'd sent to potential buyers overseas, explaining that he'd found the plants using loca location information from iNaturalist. 
The plants in question were in the genus Conophytum. I don't know if anyone's a giant succulent collector here, but um, they're called cone plants, and they're really cool. They're like these um, upside down candy corns that like grow out of the soil, and they've got this like giant flower that's bigger than a plant, and they're super cute. Uh, and to some people, they're so cute that they will pay a lot of money for them, and there is a global black market in the distribution of these plants and other succulents. So this botanist was writing to tell us that while the pandemic lockdowns had totally shut down uh, poachers coming into South Africa to poach these plants, they had unlocked this new world of, of potential poachers using the internet to communicate with locals in South Africa to convince them to poach the plants. And if you're an internet native and you need information about where these plants are, or any plant is, um, where are you going to go? Dad us. Uh, so we've been aware of this threat pretty much since the beginning, and it's why we obscured the coordinates of observations of organisms that we know to be threatened. Uh, but those of you who study information security know partial security, where you reveal a part of the truth but not the whole truth, is particularly difficult. And the stakes in South Africa are especially dire. Some species are known from only like one or two patches, like the size of a kitchen table. So a dedicated person with a shovel could literally drive a species to extinction in under an hour's work. And if that person found that population using data from iNaturalist, I would be complicit in that extinction. That's pretty much the exact opposite of the moral outcome I was hoping to achieve with iNaturalist. I wanted people, and I want people, to pay attention to other organisms. I want people to care so much about other life on Earth that they don't destroy it, and that they feel enough kinship with slugs and birds and tiny, weird desert plants with giant flowers that they want to help them thrive and keep them alive forever. So naturally, I find this email pretty disturbing, but it's complicated. If INAT helps a million people value other organisms for themselves and not for how much they can sell them for, is it worth the extinction of, of one species? If not, is there an acceptable trade-off? Maybe 10 million people benefiting for the extinction of one species? People describe new species using iNaturalist data all the time. Um, you know, they see a photo of something and are like, that's not a thing, and I'm the expert in that thing. Um, so it happens pretty frequently. So if INET helps humanity understand and describe 100 new species in the time it helps to facilitate the destruction of one, is that an acceptable trade-off? It's also worth pointing out that poaching is a vanishingly small threat to biodiversity next to the destruction of land for human use. Uh, so is it defensible for us to facilitate some collateral poaching if we can combat habitat loss by showing people what we lose each time we set up a lithium mine or a solar farm? by helping them to see creatures as peers and not acceptable collateral, da collateral damage. My opinions on this shift from day to day, but oftentimes it's hard to, hard to see the extinction of a species as really worth it. To get back to South Africa, we worked with our colleagues there to ensure records of all conophytum species were obscured, as well as other rare succulents in the country, and we've not heard of any of them going extinct on our watch, so yay. Um, and we're not even convinced that, that poacher really got their data from iNaturalist. But the point is that, that threat is real, not just for succulent plants, but for all kinds of different organisms all around the world. Bonus, a paper was just published a few weeks ago asserting that the obscuration that we apply to coordinates to protect those rare species actually leads to bad science when presumably bad scientists ignore the precision metadata that we attach to such records and base their analyses on intentionally incorrect information. So, I don't know, maybe we are the baddies. <laughs> All right, last anecdote, it's a bit of a mishmash. Um, I don't know if I just live in a hole, I mean, I guess I, I know I live in a hole, uh, but in the last year I feel like INET has become relatively pervasive in the biological and natural history circles that I, that I run in, in kind of weird ways. Uh, I was on a lichen walk earlier this year, and yes, people go on lichen walks intentionally to look at lichens. Um, and I was shocked to be uh, not the youngest attendee. Usually, like, I'm 42 years old, I'm usually the youngest person on a lichen walk by, like, 20 years. Uh, and there were all these people who were younger than me, and I was like, whoa, what's, what's that about? 
And they were all talking about, you know, observing things and whether their observations would be research grade and whether they should trust the identification of the algorithm, all of which are like pieces of INAT jargon. And it was just a bit surreal <laughs> to know that all these people were, that it had become that interwoven in kind of their personal practice. And just a few weeks ago, I was in the field with some entomologists, people who study insects, and in their downtime when they weren't outside, you know, waving a net around and catching butterflies, they had INAT open on their laptops and they were using it to share their findings from the day in real time with their colleagues um, or to identify plants. So all these bug people were like super world experts in bugs, but they weren't so world expert in plants, so they were using INAT to help them out with the plants. And it felt a bit weird <laughs> and kind of intimidating, you know, rewarding that people are using my work in a way that I hope that they would. Um, but also knowing all my biases that are sort of infiltrated into the platform, it's a little bit unsettling. But where I wanted to end was uh, earlier this year, I was working on a reboot of our mobile app, and I was really, really regretting the decision to abandon 10 years of legacy code to uh, build a new app in like a year. <laughs> and nothing was working right, and uh, something was broken with fetching GPS coordinates and it would cause you to lose all your data and it was really lame. And I was, you know, I'm sure all you MIM students can commiserate because you probably were going through this like two weeks ago, right? <laughs> um, and yeah, I was just sick of things failing. I felt like that person. Um, I was sick of things failing and uh, sick of looking at a screen and frankly sick of helping people learn about nature. Uh, so I did my best to add a little bit more logging to the app and I loaded a test copy on my phone and I jumped on the bus and I went to the local cl closest park to me that feels a little bit wild, which is called Diamond Canyon in Oakland. And I was like, cool, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna test the app and I'm gonna get some log data and I'm gonna figure this out. And Diamond Canyon is an interesting spot if you haven't been there. It's a park, it's very green, it's beautiful, but it's also just riddled with invasive plants. It has a really complicated history of redwood logging and damming and channelization and someone had the dumb idea to put a driving range in there. Anyway, drives me a bit nuts. Um, but, you know, I jumped off the bus, I stepped into the park, and took a deep breath and filled my lungs with that awesome smell and feel of like wet forest air and heard the creek babbling. And I felt instantly a lot better. And I walked up the trail a little bit and I noticed these liverworts, which are these little flat plants underneath the ivy. And I was like super excited. I was like, oh my God, liverworts. Um, and I immediately like closed the test version of the app that I had that was broken and like opened the version of the app that did work, the old version. And I was like crouched down and taking pictures of these liverworts. And this woman came up behind me with her dog and was like, what you doing there? And I was like, liverworts, like a little bit too crazily. Um, <laughs> I'm like, they're right here. They're on this embankment. And she's like, oh, cool. Uh, those are like mosses, right? And I was like, no, they're not. They're, they're, they're similar. And she's like, nah, I think you're wrong about that. I'm pretty sure they're mosses. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, they used to be both lumped in this group called Bryophyta, but these days they're, they're two separate things. Um, plus these things, they form these little scales on the soil and like, check it out. Like you can, you can just look at it right here. So I step back and she crouched down like I was crouching down and she's looking at these liverworts. And I thought to myself, this is great. Here we are, two perfect strangers, two semi-normal people talking about living things outside in this you know, complicated but also kind of enriching lang uh, landscape. It's both wild and, and not really that wild. And just trying to understand it, trying to understand this complicated cosmopolitan world together without the need for any technological intermediary, no need to encode or, or share our experiences for future discussion or for popularity or for anything. We're just two people in a weird world having a discussion about this wondrous thing. And she stood up and she was like, that's pretty interesting. I'll have to look that up when I get home. Kind of, you know, skeptical. <laughs> um, and she turned to me, this like, kindred stranger on the trail, sharing this experience that humans been, have been having for time immemorial of just seeing a weird thing outside and being like, huh, isn't that cool? And she turned to me and she's like, you are gonna post this to iNaturalist, right? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. Congratulations again to everyone and thank you so much.
Uh, Kenichi, what a fabulous speech. It was just, first of all, riveting, and second of all, humorous. And I'm glad somebody's injecting some humor into this proceeding since my jokes fell flat. Uh, <laughs> all right, so now we're going to have the student speakers. And first, let's please welcome Arissa Rose, the student speaker for MIMS. Greetings to all attendees and congrats to all graduates. My name is Arissa Irwin Rose and I'm honored to speak on behalf of my MIMS cohort. I want to start by thanking the incredible iSchool staff and faculty. These people are wonderful and have made our journey here possible and amazing, so thanks to them. Um, also want to thank all the parents and partners and support systems for any graduate in the room. Um, you do so much for us and, and we're grateful to you. And um, definitely want to thank my classmates. They've been so great and um, I'm so happy to be looking out today at all your smiling faces. And finally, to my amazing husband. Thank you. Um, of all the master's programs graduating today, MIMS is the fully in-person program. All 74 of us showed up in the fall of 2021 to a Berkeley campus that was reopening for the first time since the pandemic forced everything online. Masked up, we met each other or met each other's eyebrows and soon enough began the first year of required courses. In the fall, students from humanities backgrounds like me fought and sometimes cried our way through coding courses and confounding exams. Come springtime, my more technical peers felt the pain as they sorted through mountains of papers on the history of the bicycle, the matrix of domination, and lengthy Supreme Court proceedings. Academic or otherwise, each of us faced our own struggles that year. Another thing that happened that spring was my pregnancy. As my bump became more prominent, so did my fears that this life change would set me back or make it harder for me to fill all the ambitions I'd come to school with. I saw you all accepting summer internships at exciting companies in far off cities as I opted for a local gig that would allow me to be present for my bi-weekly doctor's visits. Don't get me wrong, I was so happy to be expecting my first child, but unsure how it would all work out because I thought I didn't have examples of success around me. That August, my wonderful daughter Asha was born. And I spent the fall semester away from campus pursuing independent studies. When I returned for classes this spring, the first days were especially hard. I was sleep deprived, struggling to balance class schedules with pumping and missing my newborn. I felt so changed and alone. But then I looked around and was awed to see that you'd changed too. I'd come back to a different group than the one I had left. Once shy international students were sporting bold new hairdos and excitedly telling me, a Berkeley native, about the coolest spots to hang. <laughs> Peers who once seemed distant from liberal politics took to the picket line, passionately chanting for fair pay with their union siblings. And everyone was hard at work on capstone projects that promised to change the world, from queer inclusive design guides and sustainability tools to deep fake detection software, we were building some really cool stuff. And many of us did that while holding down teaching positions and navigating a very uncertain and intimidating job market. It turns out I had plenty of examples of success around me. We were all doing hard things. In writing this, I realized that while everyone's evolution was impressive, it shouldn't have really surprised me. After all, our generation is no stranger to change, especially in relation to technology. In our lifetime, dial-up internet became Wi-Fi, phones became cellular, then they became smart, a social media industry came to life as we came of age, and most recently, we've seen the world embrace artificial intelligence as mainstream. 
I came to Cal knowing that algorithmic decision-making algorithm decision systems like AI can powerfully and sometimes unjustly impact people's life chances. What I didn't know is the steps to take to make those systems more just. Now I can leave, not only knowing how I want to solve those problems, but who I want to solve them with. I will turn to the UX researchers among us to understand what a user needs to feel empowered and be successful. I can trust the programmers and data science to build systems that leverage massive amounts of data in thoughtful ways. And I can turn to you product managers to pull it all together, the proverbial wedding planners of the tech industry. <laughs> MIMS taught us how to build information systems that are responsible and dynamic to the needs of global stakeholders. As we were once consumers of the world's most influential technologies, now we are the creators and the guides of it. So as we set off on our own journeys and inevitably confront moments of uncertainty or intimidation, I hope you remember this moment and our collective story of change and triumph. So what I'm saying is, take the risk, make the change, have the baby, <laughs> metaphorical or otherwise, move forward knowing that you can do hard things. Congratulations. Thank you, Arissa, really inspiring. Uh, so now I'd like to welcome the student speaker for the MIDS program, Shani Chen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, and our fellow MEDS graduates. My name is Shani Chen, and I'm honored to be standing here today as a representative of our MIDS graduating class. As we gather here to celebrate the successful completion of our MIDS program, I would like to acknowledge how far we have come. For me, it's probably about like three hour flight. Like many of you, I started the MIDS program in fall 2020, aiming to use the extra time after work to continue my learning journey despite the uncertainty COVID has brought to me. With this program building up from the fundamentals of programming and data engineering to advanced classes touching on natural language processing and deep learning, I thought I could be more confident about my future career with the extra knowledge at hand. The MITS taught me the lesson of embracing uncertainty right away when I was put as the 10th on the wait list for the W207 applied ML class. In fact, uncertainty has always been our companion in data science. Times when we try to use historical data to predict the future, when we try to work on projects with incomplete and missing data are all uncertainties we faced. But we have embraced it with resilience. Our resilience is, consists of four elements. Community, compassion, commitment, and confidence. The power of community represents the first element of resilience. As we learn from our peers with different backgrounds and also industries, and foster a community and friendship that extends beyond our time together. The second element, compassion, is exemplified by the unconditional support from our loved ones, our parents, partners, friends, and kids who are here today cheering with their crying. The third element is commitment, which is demonstrated by our amazing professors and faculties who go above and beyond to provide their guidance on our projects and also share their life lessons with us. Finally, through our continuous learning, we develop the fourth element, which is confidence. As we reflect on the four elements of resilience that have set ourselves apart, we can see how they have helped us to develop a unique ability to adapt quickly. Being adaptive is not about being reactive to changes, but about having the courage to take risks and celebrate failures. 
In our capstone projects, we often tackle some of the hardest problems in healthcare, transportation, environmental, and personal health industries. Seeking solutions to customer problems where no solutions currently exist. We take on these challenges and utilize the skills we've acquired to find working solutions, seeking the subject matter experts and learning new concepts outside of our comfort zones. The process is not easy and can lead to moments of disappointment and frustrations. But we view these moments as the opportunity for us to reflect and to improve. Our entry into the MIDS program was aligned with a time of uncertainty. We have navigated through the chip shortage, the crash of cryptocurrencies, and also the rise of new technologies like ChatGPT. As we step out of this door today, we recognize that the future holds more uncertainties. Let us celebrate the achievements and the lessons we have learned. Let us take the resilience and, adapt and the adaptability we have acquired and use them to conquer any obstacles we may face. Let's not just be ready for the future, let's shape the future with the courage and determination. I wish us all best of luck in our future endeavors, and I'm confident that we'll make great strides in the field of data science. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Shani. And next, we'll have the student speaker for the Mike's program. Let's welcome Daniel Wallace. <laughs> Good afternoon, graduates, my fellow uh, Mike's peers, Mids, Mims, and uh, our PhD graduates, uh, faculty, staff, uh, family, friends, and distinguished guests. I'm joined today by my wife and four kids. And uh, if you give her about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. If you give her about 30 seconds, she's, she'll get a camera ready for this. And, uh, <laughs> and if you hear dad, dad, or daddy, that's one of my four kids. And, um, and my wife, she brought a bullhorn and aluminum pots to bang on. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that those aren't banned. And I've, got a, and I've got one request. Once I'm done speaking, would you stand up and give me a standing ovation? It'll be my first. <laughs> so let's open up with a dad joke. Um, you know, I've been a dad for seven years now, and um, I have the critical task of keeping up with important information and documents. So where do you keep important information, your critical documents in a database. <laughs> all right, all right. So let's, uh, that, that was my wife's cue to hit the pot. <laughs> so let's, let's jump on in. It's an honor to be here to speak with you on this momentous occasion. Graduating from Berkeley as a Master of Information and Cybersecurity is a significant achievement. And we should all be proud of ourselves for reaching this point in our lives. As we sit here today, ready to continue our journeys, I wanna briefly talk to you on the continued importance of cybersecurity and also offer encouragement. In today's world, there are very few more things more critical than information and cybersecurity. Technology has revolutionized almost every aspect of our lives. And with that comes the challenge of security. Every day, we hear news about data breaches, hacks, and cyber attacks. Cybersecurity has become increasingly more important as our society becomes increasingly more digitized. Every system we use Every device we own and every website we visit has some connection to the internet. The internet has become an essential part of our daily lives 
and our reliance on it is only going to grow. Therefore, it is crucial that we prioritize cybersecurity in our personal and professional lives. This world, we need more cybersecurity professionals who not only understand technical intricacies, but also have the, the creativity and critical thinking skills to evolve with the rapidly changing landscape. Cybersecurity is exciting and constantly evolving. You know, the career field, we have endless opportunities for innovation and growth. In today's trend of remote working due to the pandemic, the demand for cybersecurity professionals has grown exponentially. We've all had to work through it. The pandemic has made cybersecurity of paramount importance. And it's become increasingly clear that we need more skilled professionals in this field. There will be ups, there will be downs, promotions and layoffs. We will make it. We are resilient. We are the nation's best. Not everyone can show that they've attended and finished from America's top information and cybersecurity master's program. That is us. We are a network of professionals who will look out for each other and promote cybersecurity wellness and cybersecurity innovation. As graduates, we have a unique opportunity to forge ahead with a higher velocity and make meaningful contributions in cybersecurity, whether if it's working for government, a private corporation, or a nonprofit organization. We add value. You could be the one who prevents the next cyber attack. You could be the one who works towards safeguarding the information of a company or a nation. Or you could be the one who helps invent the next big cybersecurity technology. Our capstones were a short glimpse of how we can create and lead the world into innovative solutions and offer value and protect people from the consequences that may come from malicious intent. Whatever career path you choose, remember that you have the power to make a positive impact. Do not let fear and uncertainty hold you back. Embrace the unknown and believe in yourself. You may not know what the future holds, but it's okay. Life is unpredictable, and sometimes the best things happen to us when we least expect them. There will be challenges, setbacks, failures, and other things that are thrown at us. But these are all opportunities to learn and grow. Do not allow failure to define you or hold you back. Instead, use those experiences as motivation and always keep moving forward. Remember that success is not defined by money, status, or power. Success is about making a positive impact in this world and being true to yourself. Once again, congratulations to every graduate that's here today, and also those who are not able to come and be in person. You are not forgotten. Remember to always do good and serve well. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, someone who knows to ask for what he wants. <laughs>
And our final student speaker speaking for the PhDs is Daniel Griffin. Please welcome him. To my fellow graduates, you did it. Well done. We all ran our own race, but none of us would be here today without the help of others. So to our family, friends, the iSchool faculty and staff, you did it too. Thank you. Well done. I want to share a bit of what it was like for me to do a PhD at our School of Information. Some say a PhD is a marathon, not a sprint. From my experience, a trail ultramarathon is the more appropriate analogy. <laughs> not because it is harder, but it's a little longer, it's more complex, there's more uncertainty, and you need much more support. It's not 26.2 miles, but more like 50 miles, or even one or 200. Not two, three, four hours, but 12, 24, or 96. Or more like the more than six years that it took Jeremy and me. When I think of a marathon, I think of a road marathon, where you're one runner in a huge crowd, a well-marked route, roads closed to cars, little cups of water, random onlookers cheering. But that's not quite what a PhD here is like. Not many of us running. There's a route, a few signs and blazes, but no clear, safe path, weaving through disciplines at times far from your fellow runners. Running across established fields, scrambling up collapsing screes, logging through sludge, sliding down snowpack, and shuffling along a seeming abyss at night. A trail ultramarathon will require more support than a Dixie cup of water, more from supporters than some shouts and a poster. Imagine aid stations every six to 12 miles, all you can eat fruit, candy, hamburgers, buckets of ice, massages, and tips and pep talks from those who've done this before. A bag of gummy bears after you said you thought you wanted to quit. We PhD students also had to have tremendous support from the staff, faculty, and fellow students. We needed help finding, let alone making sense of, what to read, where to publish, and help navigating bureaucracy. Someone to read a chapter to offer advice and encouragement, and we appreciated the leftover food after every event. <laughs> Most people you meet will be confused why you'd want to run so far, study so long, and it'd be difficult to even explain what you are doing, let alone why but it's a joy and help to run with others, learning from peers in class, talking with them in the PhD office, around Berkeley, trails all over the Bay, then regular Zoom calls with Anne and Elizabeth, Slack chats with Richmond, developing friendships through the toil, sharing papers and heartfelt feedback in Coy's doctoral research and theory workshop, experiencing revelation in Paul's classics and his and Jeff's concepts of information, we learned how to provide loving, incisive critique and how to share our close-held curiosity and hopes. And in writing papers together, Anne, Zoe, a side project with Emma in the last year, we learned to see the trail, information, and life anew. While it can be exceedingly solitary and lonely, including hallucinations in the darkness and a pandemic, we can share part of the burden. To help us, we have pacers join for some of the run, modeling tenacity, providing perspective, being there. Advisors, formal and informal, Deirdre, Steve, Jenna, Marion, Paul, Alex, or John, Coy, Stephen, Giovanni, and Antonella, to practice thinking with. Meetings and emails that give respite from doubt, advice that helps you focus on putting one foot in front of another and being able to briefly feel that you aren't lost. A package in the mail from Deirdre helpfully marking up every page of your dissertation in blue pen. If you're fortunate, you'll have a crew, family and friends who drive you to the race, meet you at aid stations, ensuring you have spare socks and can still dream of finishing, ready to laugh and celebrate with you once, you're, once it's over. The folks who let you talk at them about what you are learning, who put up with your pausing mid-conversation to jot down a note, who nurture your excitement. Their words, especially the reminder to have fun and their love stay with you. Now to my fellow PhD students, this doesn't mean you'll take over six years. It's okay if you do. I took breaks, semesters off after my father was diagnosed with brain cancer and when our eldest was born. Emily taught me to take weekends off, mostly. You can slow down and walk, change diapers and do the dishes, 
Stop and take breaks when you are hurting or tired. Maybe even take a nap at an aid station on the side of the trail or under your desk. Here at the finish line, we recognize the folks who helped along the way, from those who so many years ago encouraged us to dream, to those we know will always help us find something, a citation, what we meant to write, or another trail to head down. While parts of this might have felt lonely, we didn't do this alone. No one finishes something like this on their own. Thank you to all of our student speakers. Uh, now I have the pleasure of announcing all of the award winners across our programs. So I'll announce the name of the awards. I'll do it program by program and hold your applause uh, till we finish with each program. And, and each person, as I announce your name, why don't you stand up where you are so that we can applaud you at the end of the group, okay? So first we'll start with the MIMS program. And I will first present the uh, the Faculty Teaching Award, and in all cases, the teaching awards are voted on by the students. It's not assigned by the faculty. So this year's MIMS Faculty Teaching Award goes to John Chuang. Yeah. Okay. I guess we're not going to hold our applause. <laughs> Too hard. <laughs> That's what the staff told me to do. I guess we'll applaud as we go. Congratulations, John. Uh, all right, the MIMS Outstanding TA Award goes to Rishab Thakur. Congratulations, Rishab. The MIMS Spirit Award goes to Michael Yang. Now I'll announce the James R. Chen Awards. So uh, the final projects, the capstone projects uh, are entered into competitions, and there are four award winners this year in the James R. Chen Awards in the MIMS Final Projects. So for Group 1, the award goes to The Hidden Emissions of Electric Vehicles by Joshua Everts, Astoria Ho, and Clara Hu. The winner for group two goes to Mind by Alicia Guo, Calvin Lee, and Wazi Makomba. For group three, the award goes to Digit All, the Data Guide for Low Resource Organizations by Ian Mahond. Is he there? Did you stand, Ian? He's not here. Okay. All right, and the group four, the winner is Jeannie GNN Recommender as a Service by Pachik Ahir, Benjamin Costa, Arogya Kyoila, Heidi Lin, Ayusha Sangi, Faza Tagwa, and Michael Yang. All right, let's give a round of applause to all of the MIMS winners. And now our MIDS Award winners. So the MIDS Faculty Teaching Awards goes to, there's two of them, Joyce Shen and Alex Hughes. The MIDS Outstanding T Award winner is Mitchell Karchemski. And the fifth year MIDS Distinguished Teaching Award is, goes to Amit Bhattachara. Okay, now I'll give out the Hal Arvarian MIDS Capstone Awards. So for spring 2023, the award goes to Curie AI by Steve Hall, Romaine Hardy, Joe Kleipik, Ryan Mitchell, and Jericho Villarreal. For fall 2022, the award goes to Health Sea Air by Trevor Johnson, Matt Lyons, Arnan Patel, and Michelle Chen. Or Michelle Chen, sorry. <laughs> For 
For summer 2022, the award goes to Metamaterial AI by Dante Malagrino, Para Motomene, and Spencer Song. And the MIDS fifth year Mid Capstone Award goes to Wildfire RX by Joyce Lee, Casey McGonigal, Jenna Morabito, Kaya Shaw, and Mir Wu. Let's give a round of applause to all the MIDS award winners. <laughs> Finally, our Mike's award winners. The Distinguished Teaching Award winner is Clarence Chio. Right here. All right, and the Capstone Awards, uh, the Lily L. Chen, Mike's Capstone Awards for, just a moment, the year right, Spring 2023, goes to In Home by Isabel Delmas, Joseph Gillinelli, Siraj Ilavala, and Andrew Robertson. For fall 2022, it goes to Open Privacy Bridge by Ab Abinish Aral, Christy Edwards, Jesse Fuchs, Sean Goofy, and Edgar Lunabrito. <laughs> and for summer 2022, the Mike's Capstone Award goes to Ozki by Lauren Ayala, Su uh, Su Voyij Basak, Anthony Hallam, and Mariah Martinez. All right. So, a round of applause to all the Mike's Award winners. Congratulations to all the award winners. When the ceremony ends, we ask award recipients to come up on stage to re receive their awards and take a photo. All right, so next on the program is the hooding of the PhDs, and I'd like to invite Professor David Bamman to come up to announce the hooding. Thank you, everyone. So we're here today to really celebrate students who are graduating from four degree programs. And we're gonna start with the graduates of our PhD program in information science. Now, these are students who have been a part of our community in South Hall and in the School of Information the longest, right? They've dedicated half a decade of their lives and often more, right? They have run the ultra marathon that Daniel just described um, entirely in the pursuit of new knowledge. Right? In their research, these students have pushed the frontiers of what's knowable, um, <clears throat> and they contribute in their dissertation to the sum of knowledge that really benefits us all. Right? From reimagining web search and exploring the ways in which our use of search engines is entangled in social values, to exploring the degree to which our human capacity for foresight is really shaped by our own embodied interaction. This work advances our understanding of how people engage with technology and at the same time really interrogates what it means to be human. So we're celebrating two PhD students today who have just done this. They've gone through this process. I'm going to ask them in turn to come up on this stage, stand before you all along with their PhD advisor who will have the honor of bestowing their doctoral hood. I'm going to ask you all to bear witness to this important moment as we send them off into the world. So first up is going to be Daniel Griffin. Daniel, please come up. <laughs> Along with his advisor, Deirdre Mulligan, Daniel's thesis is titled Situating Web Searching in Data Engineering, Admissions, Extensions, Repairs, and Ownership. Congratulations, Dr. Griffin. And next we have Jeremy Gordon. 
please come up. Along with his advisor, John Chuang. Jeremy's thesis is entitled, Embodying the Future, Modeling the Kinematics of Planning as Prospective Mental Simulation. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Gordon. All right, so up next then, we're going to ask John Chuang to remain standing and carry us through the MIMS graduation. Thank you all. Now it's time for us to uh, confer degrees to our graduating class of MIMS 2023. Michael Songwu Yang. <laughs> Orissa Irwin Rose. Go ahead. Timothy Connolly Schott. Daniel Furman. Christopher Scott Ferenczi. Joshua Everts. Siddharth Adelka. <laughs> Lenore Alcaraz Guzman. <laughs> Princess M. Gordon. Shahan Shahid Nawaz. Eileen W. Cahill. Beatrice Farigon. Ian Castro. <laughs> Gapreet Kaur Khalsa. <laughs> Renat Abdallah. Catherine Yu. <laughs> Mira Vinod. <laughs> Mudit Mangal. Arogya Koyorala. <laughs> Ayushi Sangi. <laughs> Shreshta Bhatt.
Anshita Arya. Kedari Lahari Nara. Richa Verma. Amea Knight. Pratik Dilip Ahar. <laughs> Jingsu Ray. <laughs> Alyssa Guo. Calvin Lee. Akshay Dan Bavas Juliman. Haritha S. Ramakrishnan. Alicia E. Zhao. Jane Lupica. Karin Simone Puglia. Anukriti Goyal. Clara L. Hu. Astoria Ho. Adil Ahmad Chowdhury. <laughs> Rohan Ramani. <laughs> este Chahavichite. Jessica A. Ingo. Daniela Alejandra Perez. Austin G. Bill. Romit Barua. Sarah Elizabeth Barrington. Gotham Kuma. Ailea Tuan. <laughs> Rishad Tako. <laughs> Ali.
Aksha Dandia. Ave Tusha Lat. Avash Adhikari. Onella Raisa Chumi. Yusef Abdu. Alora Jasmine Clark. Aluani Femi Aluadara Ajayi. Benjamin Fell. Wazanai Makumba. <laughs> Wei Jie Jiang. <laughs> Melissa Lecari. Shaitaj Ko Daliwal. <laughs> Molly Zhang. <laughs> Shi Chen. Heidi Lin. <laughs> Ray Lee. <laughs> Angela Leo. Faize Tekwa. <laughs> Ellen Kao. <laughs> Mary Grace Reich. Marissa Danielle Corey. <laughs> Jennifer Mariko Chan. Now let me uh, invite Professor Daniel Aranki to come onto the podium.
Well, congratulations to all the graduates so far and the ones coming up. It is my uh, honor to introduce to you what I was going to describe as uh, the best, uh, the graduates of the best cybersecurity program in the nation, but Daniel stole me that tagline. So now I'm going to say the ones with the winners of the loudest cheers throughout these proceedings. So, my honor. Daniel Wallace. Isabel Delmas. Sunjana Prasanna. Manjunath Ravi. Tree Farm. Justin Leonard Buzon. Gerald Ethan Hall. Aditya Parthasarathi. Somia Bijala. Andrew Crane. Charlie Shaw. Jose Roberto Valades. Lauren Ayala. Maria Martinez. Oh. Mariah Martinez. Devi Praya Busi Reddy. Juliana Marion Mooney. Edgar Luna Brito. Manus Gandhi. <laughs> Ahmed Minaj. <laughs> Ian Scott Clark. Wewek Patek. Naveen Janarthanan. Harrison Andrew Pierce. Gabrielle Vera. Tor Raymond Pearson.
Kobe Zhang. Taylor Rainey. Alyssa Catherine Edmond. Jorge Arturo Ramirez Reina. Andrew Scott Robertson. John Fuello. Christy Browder Edwards. Jacob Glad. Richard Zenz. Jesse Fuchs. Umesh Taniru. Suvujit Basak. Virginia Gresham. Kyle Hakez. Anthony Michael Scheller. Joseph Allen. Robert Crawford. Once again, I'd like to congratulate all the Mike's graduates. Uh, stay awesome and go Bears. And uh, and at this at this time, I'd like to uh, invite my colleague, Professor uh, Paul Laskowski, to introduce uh, the next program graduates for Mids. Thank you, everyone. The Master of Information and Data Science is a program that is cutting edge, intellectually stimulating, and challenging. Mid students take nine courses, learning about data pipelines, time series forecasts, and why you should never, never accept the null hypothesis. <laughs> I had to get that in one last time for you all. At the same time, Mid students practice reasoning about the ethical and social implications of the systems that they work with. In short, the students you are about to see have worked very hard, and they are on their way to becoming true leaders in data science. It is now my honor to announce the Mid's graduates. Shani Cheng. Vaishali Kandalwal. Diana Carolina Chacon. Oh. 
Luis Delgado. Irene Rogan Schaffer. Heather Rancic. Tal Rivka Segal. Frankie Bunn. Serenivas Jaka. Fasudev Kilada. Dasarathi Alayavili Panapan. Sunit Carpenter. <laughs> Druvi Kothari. <laughs> Kumar Narayanan. Jagannathan Lakshmipathy. Kevin Lustig. Sri Yana Mandra. Amir Saman Aribali. Ameya Mahajan. Atrei Dasmaha Patra. Pavan K. Amani. Ajaya Tarikere Jayaram. Carlos Ortiz Gomez. Sudriti Kumar Mondal. Jai Shankar Raju. Amit Karandikar. Kritesh K. Shrestha. <laughs> Mohammed Sondo. <laughs> S 
Sundeep Kumar Mahansaria. <laughs> Yi Ju Chen. <laughs> Mitch Arciaga Abdon. Joy A. First. <laughs> Sichen Chong. <laughs> Fidelia M. Noir. Su K. Sung. Mariah S. Meehan. Ricardo Henes. Donald A. Ziff. <laughs> Valerie Chow. Gabriela Mai Lagunes. Margo Jocelyn Suryanaga. Cody Douglas. Berker. Francisco Miguel Aguirre Villarreal. John Koch. Millie Guerra. <laughs> Stephanie Laface. <laughs> Napoleon Paxton. Joe Mirza. <laughs> Madhu Hedge. <laughs> Rohith Serenivas. Param Matameni. <laughs> Romaine Hardy. <laughs> P 
Arastu Chu. Joseph Klepich. Jonas Patrick Yoshio Degnan. Basumitra Chaki. Amanjot Kar Samra. Eric Martinez. Karthikeyan Sakvivel. Jordan Meyer. Elizabeth Nichols. Benjamin Mock. Tanya Flint. Krutika Ingale. Autumn Nicole Rains. Rumi Nakagawa. Rasal Minhas. Raghav Kashik. Audrey Phone. Sean Koval. Young Hoon Kim. Yuri Shevchenko. Steve Hall. Jericho Villarreal. Allison Fox. Carly Anne Marie McCleary. Heather Piashala.
Rohin Chabra. Tony Jiao Wei Fan. Oscar Linares Leon. Giorgio Giacomino Sioju. Jason Yang. Aditya Dave. Andrew Warren Bailey. Victor Ramirez. Michael Luis Malave. Jonathan Mogus. Chen Shi Lu. Julian Cashel Leventhal Hicks. Mima Mirkovic. Rex Pan. Melissa Keiko McGee. <laughs> Rathin Bector. <laughs> Carlos Fernando Calderon. Elda Pere. <laughs> Niharika Sitomer. <laughs> J. Paul Singh Batia. Evan Stokes Phillips. Tessa DeVries. Angela Shan Guan. Annie 
Sway. Gabriel Louis Kyren. Senia Usovich. <laughs> Kavya S. Shah. <laughs> Joyce Lee. Simran N. Suchdev. Shani Shay. Mir Wu. Jeremy Young. <laughs> Shirley Jang. <laughs> Kevin Schwan. Yi Zhang. <laughs> Andre Gerard Terzakian. <laughs> Jennifer Condi. Spencer Ryun Ki Song. <laughs> Joshua Stephen Dunn. <laughs> Justine Taylor. Prathusia Charangondla. George Leva Rodriguez. In Tay Kim. Simon Augustin Silva. <laughs> Max Alexander Hoff. <laughs> Charles Bayard Carlson. Jonathan Whiteley. Ryan W. Brown. Michael Rainiac.
Murray Stokely. Sean Michael Lowe. Mark Semenik. Kevin Eng. Oliver Chi Young Cheng. Francisco Valdez de la Fuente. Percy Burnett. Jacob Adam Barkow. Anand V. Patel. Trevor Penn Johnson. Michelle Jennifer Shen. Matthew S. Lyons. Mary Chow. Catherine Tsai. Opeyemi Bolarinwa Ola Nipikun Samuel Omosuyi Anil Tipurneni Marcus Manos. <laughs> Hannah Grossman. Titilayo Agbapiaka. Sarah Kine. Jose Alexander Torres. Hill Alsi <laughs> CJ Donahoe <laughs> Edda Kavla Kolu
Grant Michael Wilson. Krishna Prasad Kangorpali. Pradeep Chalpati. Inky Beck. <laughs> Natalie Ojeda Meneses. <laughs> Tian Tian Zhao. Yu Chao Chen. Chi Ma. Yao Chen. Ming Chen. <laughs> Fang Yao Luo. <laughs> Thomas Gao. Ju Ming Lai. <laughs> Daniel Ryu. <laughs> Vijay Ranganatha. Vishwanatham Thyaga Rajan. <laughs> Rakesh Wali Shatter. <laughs> Luis Chion Chacon. Marina Lini Sharma. <laughs> Kevin Fu. <laughs> Dante Malagrino. Thomas Welsh. <laughs> K 
Kurt Oilau. Bronte Bear. Yue Ling. Estonia Ingo Yima. Amanda Lee. Sania Laka. Tajesvi Bhatt. Emily Huang. Kevin No. Roy Katende. Estrella Giannassi. Francis Leung. Toby Petty. <laughs> Nicholas Robert Manuel Schantz. Nitin Pillai. Broderick Cormier. Andy Mori Peterson. Alexander Toe. <laughs> Julia Franco Olson. <laughs> Delaney Shiren. Ginny Perky. <laughs> Isabel Garcia Pietri. <laughs> Riaz Kazmani.
Arissa Nguyen. Noriel San Buenaventura Fargo. Ruby Han. Aditya Bajaj. Richard Du. John R. Calzaretta. Alexander McBride Karit. Sybil Santos Bergen. David Paletz. <laughs> Teresa Kuruvilla. Congratulations. Once again, congratulations to all of the MIDS graduates. Wow, congratulations everyone. Great job, Paul, with those names. Uh, it's very hard to do. All right, as we approach the end of our ceremony, I want to thank all of the family and friends who've come so far to support our new graduates. It means a lot to all of them. I want to thank the staff of the iSchool for your hard work, and once again for doing a wonderful job with graduation. <laughs> Uh, before we end, I want to remind and invite all of our award winners back up on stage for photos after we close. Finally, to all of our graduates, I would like to ask you all to please stand. Everyone join me in giving them one more round of applause. graduates, remember the iSchool, be a good alum, stay in touch with us, don't let us lose touch with you, stay in touch with your friends, and let's make a, continue to make a strong and warm and successful school of information. We will now have a formal recessional for our graduates to exit the auditorium. We invite all of our guests to join your graduates outside for some light refreshments at our reception. So please, you can head on out, cue the music. <laughs>